You're now listening to the Zod and Drea podcast. Hey, welcome to another episode of the Zod and Drea podcast. Welcome, everyone. We have an exciting podcast for you today. Yes, we are going to have a really good podcast where we're going to discuss something with an absolute expert on the subject. Um, We are going to talk with Nancy McLean, who is an American historian. She's an author, a professor at Duke University. I mean, what doesn't she do? I I don't know. There's a lot. And she, did, I mean, she does a lot. So. A lot, a lot, a <laughs> lot. Achieved a lot in her life so far. So far. And she is also an accomplished author. So if you haven't done it, please make sure you check out her book, which is called, say it. Are we ready? Democracy, Democracy in, in Change. Change. <laughs> <laughs> so it's Democracy in Change. Um, don't also forget, there will be a tour that is coming up with uh, Nancy McLean, and it will be here in Phoenix, Arizona. So. It's called Rockin' Democracy. It will be here on Sunday, September 23rd, where I will also be an MC. So hold your boots because I will be there as well. But we will be listening to Dr. McLean um, as well as David Garcia, who is Democratic uh, candidate for governor, and Terry Goddard. What time and what place again? Um, we are talking about the press room at 441 West Madison in Phoenix. So... I think um, it's about that time. Well, and what time? Yeah, and what time does it? Does oh, it, you know what? Why am Why am I uh, bugging out of the time? Um, I'm like this way. I'll, everybody can plan around it. Yeah, you know what? Why doesn't the flyer say the time? We'll get to We'll get to that in a second. <laughs> it's like doors open at one o'clock. So there we doors go. open at one o'clock to three. That's right, because it's going to be. What you want? But anyway, we want to make sure that we welcome you then to the Doctor Nancy McLean. How are you doing? I'm doing well. <laughs> All right. Good to be with you. Thank you. Thank you for joining our podcast. And um, we are really welcoming you because it's going to be absolutely an interesting night that night um, when we get to hear from you as well as I guess some I'm hoping that we'll be able to discuss a little bit of uh, your book, Democracy in Chains. Great. Yes, I think that is the plan. <laughs> it really speaks to our current political moment. Uh, and you in Arizona are at ground zero for the radical right stealth plan uh, for America that I describe in the book. Exactly. And that's exactly why we wanted to have you, because number one, it is something that is happening in the in the United States right now where the right has become, I, I, I would even agree, it has become radicalized. Uh, some people also say the same thing about the left, where they compare it to Antifa. Mm-hmm. Would you make that type of a comparison from right to left? No, I think it's silly. (laughs) Uh, That is not the case. What you have, you have an aroused uh, presence. And, you know, I don't, it's not, I mean, we have a very radicalized right. uh, And then what we have is the rest of the spectrum (laughs) from moderate to uh, far left that is aroused because they're understanding that something really unsettling has been happening to our democracy. And we've been seeing it with a special force uh, since the 2010 midterms when Mm -hmm. so many, uh, Democrats didn't turn out to vote, frankly, yeah. and so many young people did not vote, and so many people of color and others. Uh, people talked about the enthusiasm gap in that that particular midterm uh, after President Obama had been elected, and as a result of that failure to turn out, the this radicalized Republican Party, and we'll come back to why I use that language, uh, this radicalized Republican Party got control of the redistricting uh, process that happens every 10 years with the census and uh, used that to affect the most radical and sophisticated gerrymandering in our political mm-hmm. history in this country in order to make it so that the elected officials uh, of a minority party, in many cases, as in my own North Carolina, could choose their voters rather than the way it should be with voters choosing their elected officials. Um, so that gerrymander was hugely important, and, and all that has flowed from that since in the way of radical changes have aroused people who care about democracy and who care about playing by the rules and who care about fairness and transparency, and that's what we're seeing, you know, not on the right. Dr. McLean, you had mentioned that Arizona, uh, you said, seems to be ground zero for the sudden movement. What indicators have you noticed that makes Arizona this, again, 
beta, if you will, or ground zero for this. Right. Well, there would be the Tea Party domination of your state government and your mm-hmm. Supreme Court. Um, the fact that your sitting governor, Doug Ducey, uh, is a regular attendee at the uh, donor summits convened by Charles Koch of uh, billionaire and multimillionaire donors who yes, are trying to radically change our country without being honest with the people. There is the fact that your legislature is gutting your public education system while uh, pushing vouchers for private schools. Um, you could point to the way your Supreme Court overruled a very, very popular invest in education uh, initiative. Uh, we could look at the longstanding influence of the Goldwater Institute uh, mm-hmm. on your state politics. It's part of something called the State Policy Network that's part of the Koch Network. Uh, or we could also look at your uh, Koch-funded academic centers at Arizona State University and at the University of Arizona that are using tax taxpayer monies to subsidize an extreme right uh, intellectual agenda that is linked to the Koch political project. And I know this because in my book, Democracy in Chains, I studied the creation of the first such Koch funded faculty center at George Mason, the flagship such Mm. operation, Mm. and there it is really clear that they are using, in their term, leveraging higher education to serve a political project. Wow. So can I ask you, I mean, it's, it's weird for them to wind up attacking through that system, but it's smart. Do you know when it wound up being that the right, and I would have to just specify the right had become way more radicalized and gone way further right in the, uh, let's say, Bush one and also the Reagan era? Mm-hmm. Or do you think that it has gone further right even before that, such as Nixon? When did it wind up getting right. in that direction? Right, this Coke Donor Network project, yeah, it's a mistake, actually, at this point to confuse um, uh the Koch project with conservatism, gotcha. <laughs> for one. Um, so the, the language that much of our, our media uses no longer captures the situation we're facing. So this Koch-led radical right includes people who believed that Ronald Reagan was a failure and a disappointment, wow. that he did not go far enough in changing our country. They found George W. Bush, uh, a, a president that, that most historians would say was the most conservative um, you know, up to that point. They found him to be a terrible uh, disappointment George, because, H- for one thing, he provided H- a senior citizen drug benefit. H.W. H- um, H- so Bush or W. Bush? I'm sorry. Uh, no, W. Oh, w. Wow. The, okay. the son. Yeah. No. So these people are extremely radical. And and b- actually, back. You know, you were talking about. You know, how we trace this back. So my story that I tell in Democracy in Chains begins in the South in the 1950s, where I picked up this trail. Um, but the 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 um, connection of this uh, Nobel Prize winning Southern economist I found in Virginia and Charlottesville, uh, he became connected with Charles Koch about 1970. If not before, uh, and it through an agenda that involved privatizing education, uh, and began working with him in this uh, network uh, and infrastructure of organizations that Charles Koch funded and steered towards, um, uh, you know, these these radical right purposes. But Charles Koch was honest in the 1970s, and the Cato Institute, which he uh, founded and funded, was honest in that they recognized they were radical. Koch said they should never compromise; they should be open about their radicalism. And they were then. At that point, they said that, you know, they supported uh, sex between any consenting adults, for example, wow. including pro- <laughs> they wanted to legalize prostitution. You know, they thought there should be no no restraints on um, uh, homosexuality. Some of them even talked about whether children could consent to sex. They were that Jesus. freaky radical <laughs> in their libertarianism. Uh, you know, and they supported many other things, drug legalization, you know, ending uh, U.S. intervention uh, around the world. All these kinds of things that were very, very radical. But what they came to realize, and Koch in particular, is that they would never be able to recruit a majority to the world they were trying to bring into being. That would include, for example, no Social Security, no Medicare, no no public schools, et cetera. That is their ultimate dream vision, this extremely stark economic liberty agenda that has no place for the public and for government regulations, for the things that most of us want. 
So Koch realized that they could never win by really being truly, fully honest in a democracy. And so by the 1990s, he turned to what I call a stealth strategy. Um, and part of that stealth strategy involves misrepresentation. Instead of openly embracing the fact that they are the radical right, the radical reactionary right, they now present themselves as conservatives. That mm. is not true, right? right. Um, they are using conservatives. They also have uh, leveraged, to use their language, the religious right, right? So they are um, enlisting the fears and the theological commitments uh, of uh, believers, you know, particularly white evangelical Christian believers, in order to advance a radical libertarian agenda that is at odds with the best of every major religious tradition in the world, not just Protestantism, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it, it is so um, so deeply cynical that it's, it's really stunning. But again, I think that, you know, an example of that cynicism is calling this conservative, when actually what these people really seek, you could say, is essentially the revocation of the 20th century of public policy, right? They don't approve of the New Deal. They don't believe that workers should have federally backed uh, rights to organize. They don't support Social Security as social insurance or Medicare. They're against public education. I mean, I could go on and on. They don't think we should have regu government regulation of our air and water quality. Now, these are things that the vast majority of Republicans as well as Democrats support the voters. And so in order to get this agenda through, they have to use stealth. What do I mean by stealth? I mean things like promoting what it, uh, the lie, the myth of mass voter fraud in order to justify measures to suppress the vote. I mean that gerrymander we talked about before. Right. I mean destroying the power of public sector labor unions, particularly teachers unions, so that they can then go on to undermine public education as a whole. Uh, I mean climate science denial, which the Koch network promotes uh, – more than I think even the oil companies at this this point. So this is really, really serious stuff. You know, I'm a historian. I'm almost 60. I've been, you know, in in the you know academia teaching now for for uh, some 30 years. Published many books, and I have never felt such urgency about what is happening to our public life. We are at the point of an all hands on deck emergency for democracy in this country, and yet. The president is distracting uh, the attention of voters with his daily tweets and outrages, and people get all stirred up and focus on him when this radical agenda is moving through federal departments and agencies, through the 30 states controlled by this cause, and through the courts. Mm -hmm. That's what we need to be paying more attention to. Now, you bring up a great point regarding Trump. Now, it sounds like a lot of these topics – uh, are and issues are very supported by his administration. But what are your thoughts about Charles Koch last month criticizing uh, the Trump administration regarding the trade war and the, and the budget deficit? And I'm sorry to ask you this question so quickly because we do have a minute left. Yeah, but just want your thoughts on that. We have like 45 seconds. <gasps> Well, I would say look at all Charles Koch has not criticized Donald Trump about, and that tells you what you need to know. The only thing he's spoken out about in a significant way is the tariff. Otherwise, they have been using their group, Americans for Prosperity, to insulate Trump, to push through his judicial nominees, to get the changes they want, uh, that get the tax bill that is going to destroy our budget, that's driving up the deficit so that they can then convene a constitutional convention. We should talk about that in order to change our Constitution, people should not be misled. I think that was, uh, you know, it was a, a, a feint, really, to distract attention in some ways, perhaps too, from the Kavanaugh nomination, where Trump is absolutely doing the Koch Network's bidding okay, in stocking we're gonna, the Supreme Court. We're going to have to come right back with Dr. McLean. We're going to take a break real quick. Please listen carefully. Please listen. Carefully. Hey, what's up, everybody? I'm Zod. And I'm Drea. And we want you to check out the Zod and Drea podcast every Tuesday. Where can everybody find us at? Hmm. You can always check us out on www.zodandrea.com. Where else? You can always check us out also on Facebook at Zod Andrea. Instagram? Zod Andrea. Snapchat. Zod and Drea. YouTube. Zod and Drea. I see a pattern. I see a pattern. <laughs> so if you haven't caught that, catch us at Zod Andrea on all the social networks. But also make sure you subscribe to the Zod Andrea podcast where? At ZodAndrea.com. And also on YouTube and iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, 
and iHeartRadio, we're coming for you. Let us know what you think. And if you want to be a guest, reach out to us. And put all of your input into whatever our topics are for the week. So we hope to check you out and see you there. Bye. Okay, we are back with Dr. McLean, author of Democracy in Chains. And I wanted to ask you, you had mentioned that there is an urgency um, in the country right now um, about our democracy being, I guess, uh, in a tailspin downward. Would you be able to explain almost step by step what that means and how it's going to happen or how it's happening? Sure. Um, well, what we have seen uh, over uh, the last uh, almost 10 years, particularly since those 2010 midterms where uh, the turnout from the right was high and the rest of the people was low, um, is that in every state that this radicalized Republican Party, we can come back to why I call it that if you'd like, but yes. this radicalized Republican Party in every state where they got control, they began to rush through a very radical agenda of transformation uh, that included fundamental changes in the rules of governance. So in my state of North Carolina, we saw attacks on public sector unions, particularly teachers unions. We saw um, uh, radical cuts in spending on public education and in changes to the governance of our public university system. We saw the state pushing out uh, tax monies to private schools that were under no legal obligation, one shock judge said in his ruling, to teach students anything. Um, these totally unregulated uh, private schools, um, many of them religious, some of them online, just ridiculous um, undermining of our public education system. We saw voter suppression, you know, uh, uh, undermining of environmental regulation, et cetera. You guys have seen it too. Yeah. Basically what this radicalized right is doing is systematically changing the rules and breaking the norm wherever they've come into power uh, in a way that would let them, again, achieve changes that they know are not popular with the people, with voters of any party, frankly, you know, on some of this stuff. So it's it's really uh, quite serious what's happening at the state level, which is not getting enough attention from our national journalists. And I, I think I mentioned there's 30 states now controlled by this cause. Um, and then the other thing, though, that I would point to is the very significant changes that are going through our legal system, uh, including some of the decisions that have just been made by a Supreme Court, which is stocked with candidates who have been vetted by the Federalist Society, for which Charles Koch provided the seed money years ago, and the Koch, Net Koch Network continues to support, who, who back a very, very um, uh, uh, reactionary, I can only say, um, uh, understanding of the Constitution. Uh, and then the biggest thing, though, is that um, in the states, uh, this radical right is pushing for new constitutional amendments. In, in my state, they're doing this. They're doing this in others. I'm not sure whether yours, um, uh, they're doing it in yours. But ultimately, what they're building toward is the first constitutional convention convened by the states in our political history. Mm. You know, not since the Constitution was ratified have we ever had a constitutional convention convened under Article 5. We have um, amended the Constitution many times, but in the normal route where you go through Congress and then go out to the states, what this Koch donor network through the American Legislative Exchange Council, uh, which guides these Republican elected officials, what they are doing is lining up authorizations from states in order to change our fundamental national rule book. So they have now gotten the uh, authorizations from they need from 28 of the 34 states that would be needed to call a constitutional convention. Uh, so that means they have six more. And guess what? There are six Republican-controlled states that have not yet authorized. So, you know, again, this is an emergency situation for our democracy and our legal system. And the sad fact is that uh, other than some nonprofits like Common Cause has been following this constitutional convention very well, and a few, may, you know, maybe a, you can like a dozen articles in the national press, the, the journalists have fallen down on the job on this. They've again been distracted by the president's tweets and by all the stuff they see in, in Washington, and they're not paying attention to this stealth, quiet effort to change the Constitution. 
I did an interview uh, on this a few weeks ago on the Bill Maher show, mm -hmm. um, so people might look for that too, because you know a lot of people found that really helpful uh, and informative. But they could just you know Google my name and Bill Maher, and they'd get it. It's a five-minute interview, uh, but it, it goes through the details of this. But I would say that is the ultimate and most important challenge because they would change the rules so radically that the only way the people could reclaim our democracy is essentially through insurrection. They're basically making it illegal. Um, they, they ultimately would like to make it illegal for, or you know, um, seen as against the Constitution for the kinds of things that majorities of Americans have supported, uh, you know, over the 20th century from, again, social insurance like Medicaid, uh, Medicare and um, Social Security to environmental protection to workers' rights to organize, even they to show you how radical this is. They even want to revoke the Seventeenth Amendment to the Constitution, which was a victory of the Progressive Era against the robber barons, the big you know swaggering corporations of that era uh, that that controlled state government, and so it was a big. Uh, victory for progressives uh, to win the 17th Amendment that let the people directly elect our U.S. senators. senators mm -hmm. yeah. One of the liberty amendments that this Koch-led right is pushing for would revoke the 17th Amendment and restore to state legislatures the power to choose U.S. senators. Now, why would they do that? Because state legislators, the state legislatures are much more easily captured by corporations, and we have tons of research that shows this. So this is a very systematic, strategic long game to take power from the vast majority of people in order to ensure a kind of arch version of economic liberty for the wealthiest and corporations who don't share the public's understanding of the common good. And that was my uh, question I was going to ask is all of these actions that they're doing, what is their end goal? What is their, their the main goal to change our system? Into what? Right. Well, they would use language like liberty, personal responsibility, prosperity, etc. But when you drill down and you actually read the, 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 the writings of these folks and pay attention to their correspondence and all the kinds of uh, archival research uh, resources that I mine for my book, Democracy in Chains, what you find is that everything hinges on the definition. So their version of liberty is not like your and my vision of freedom. It's not about the right to political dissent. It's not about freedom from domination, as most social movements in our history have fought for. No, it's about economic liberty, radical economic liberty for property owners so that they don't have to be bothered by a democracy that might would say, hey, you don't have a right to pollute our air and waterways, right, right? right? You don't have a right to to crush workers and them not have any other recourse except to quit. You know, it, all these, you know, it, it's basically if you cut through the bromides um, and the fancy phrasing, what you see is a vision so stark that I think even some science fiction writers would have trouble capturing it because to my mind, it would, in the mind of many of my listeners and people who have read the book, it would result in an utterly unsustainable society on every measure, certainly environmentally, because these people are slamming shut the window that we have to deal with the um, climate change, yeah. uh, because they're so hostile to government that they, they, they won't allow it, allow us to do anything, and they push out the myth of, uh, you know, they, they push out climate science denial to stop us from acting, but it would also be economically unsustainable, because their economic model has been shown repeatedly to fail. You can look at Oklahoma now, where people are resisting it. You can look at Kansas, where yeah. Republicans have turned on it. Um, it th their social model is devastating. I've talked to clergy across de uh, denominations, to mothers of uh, uh, children with disabilities, to all kinds of people who understand what a threat this radically reconstituted world would be if this kind of libertarian utopia goes through. But basically, I'd say, you know, in, in summary, that it's a kind of messianic agenda, right? Charles Koch is a messianic figure. He has compared himself to Martin Luther of the Protestant Reformation. Hmm. 
He said when, when launching this big bid for transformation in 1997, and I quote him in, in the book, um, he said, I want to unleash the kind of force that propelled Columbus to his discoveries, right? So here's Charles Koch, this multi-billionaire, you know, one of the richest people on the planet and the richest people in world history, who has it in his mind that he doesn't like the way our democracy works, right? And he doesn't like the restrictions that people like him face, so he's going to reconstitute our society by using that immense wealth and that of the other donors he's assembled uh, in order to push through this kind of stealth agenda for change. We've seen this movie before. You know, that is a messianic way of thinking. This person who actually kind of imagines that he's our messiah and he's going to change our society, you know, so whether it's him or whether it's communism or whether it's fascist, like that's the way those people think. And that is toxic to a democracy. And I think that we're seeing that toxicity in the way that this cause is ginning up hostility um, uh, among the people. And, and we're seeing more and more polarization and hostility and inability to act together because messianic figures refuse to compromise. And that is who Charles Koch is, and that is the, the approach that they enforce on people who get their money, and we see that in the Republican Party. My dad was a Republican. He voted for the Republican Party almost his entire life, except for H.W. Bush. <laughs> um, oh, uh, you know, when he died in 2000, he would not recognize today's Republican Party at all. And I think many Republicans, voters, are in that position of scratching their heads and wondering what happened to their political party. But I think if you read the book, or you, you know, Jane Mayer's book, Dark Money, is also very good on this. What you see is that this Coke donor network has changed the incentives and the rules of the political process by using dark money funded primary challenges to Republican office holders who don't comply with this radical right agenda to punish them. Uh, and, to, and they reward with dark money those who do comply with the agenda. And by doing that, they've made the Republican Party accountable to these arch right wealthy donors rather than ordinary Republican voters. And you can see this play out in health care. You know, I mean, the vast majority of people think that we should be protecting people, you know, providing health insurance for people who have pre-existing conditions, yeah, for think, example. Yeah. But the donors are against that, and that's what we're seeing play out. So I think once people – that's what I'm hearing from people who have, you know, read the book – and, you know, who come away with it, that they're actually feeling, even though it's scary, you know, it and it is, like, so audacious what this Coke network is doing. Once people understand it, they feel empowered. They feel knowledgeable. They feel like they can see where all this craziness is ultimately coming from, and they see what they might be able to do about it. So that is really gratifying to me, that people are feeling like – they're getting information that is enabling them to reclaim their democracy from these forces and be able to turn it to purposes that actually cross parties. Mm -hmm. You know, most people, Republican and Democrat, want to support our public education system. They believe it should be better funded. They believe that teachers should be paid salaries that enable them to live on one job, <laughs> you know, not multiple. Exactly. Um, they believe we should have clean air and water. They believe that we should support our national parks. You know, I could go on and on and <laughs> on about all the areas of consensus, but what's happened is this donor network through these organizations, it funds, and, you know, there are dozens at the national level, hundreds if you count the state level and the international level. They even have something called the Atlas Network. These organizations are working systematically to, in a sense, pollute the public conversation and to gin up hostility uh, among the people they need to turn out to vote for their agenda well, you know? we, w we want to because we only have like 15 seconds left believe it or not okay um it went by really quickly but um we were really happy to have you here and thank you we're gonna plug you in a second but thank you for coming up on the zydendrea thank podcast you so much and educating it's everybody. such a pleasure to be with you i look forward to meeting you in person at the press room Absolutely. arizona can't wait to see you so arizona if you have not heard please do listen and if you haven't, please buy your tickets. It's $10 reserve seats at the press room, 441 West Madison, Phoenix, to see Nancy McLean. Listen to her. She is the author of Democracy in Chains. And this is Rockin' Democracy. It's going to be on Sunday, September 23rd. Doors open at 1 o'clock all the way to 3. 
I myself will be the MC. Live music by The Harvest. David Garcia will be there. Terry Goddard. We will talk about how the right has gone radical and what that means to the United States as well as the democracy. And it will also connect into how it happens to you. Right. And then hopefully give some like next steps on what we can do to empower and get our power back. Exactly. Yeah, actually, because we didn't talk about that right. here. So we will talk about that there because actually, though the story I tell is frightening, I actually feel hopeful. I really do believe this can be turned around, but people have got to be paying attention and they've got to move into action. All right, people. Zadria.com. We'll talk to you later. <laughs>